This podcast is part of the Michigan Sports and Entertainment Podcast Network. Go to michigansportsandentertainment.com for more great podcasts. Welcome to MSE Countdown with your host, David Rosenberg and Chase Sussex. The countdown starts now. Now. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Michigan Sports and Entertainment Countdown. I'm your host, David Rosenberg. I'm here with Chase Sussex. Chase, what's up? Yo, what's going on, everybody? So we're trying a new thing today. Uh, We got Chase kind of on the phone, so he might sound a little different, but we're hoping that those little skips that come in right when he starts talking uh, go away. So if you hear any of that, uh, let us know in the comments and give us some feedback because we're trying to fix the show so that you guys enjoy it a little bit better. And without further ado, let's get the countdown started now. Well, our first story today, I mean, Chase, we've been talking about the trade deadline like like it's the most important thing of the summer for the past couple of weeks. And it finally came and went, and we're going to kind of break down these stories one by one. Uh, So the first one that we have to talk about, I think I'm going to consider this one the biggest, Nicholas Castellanos was traded to the Cubs. The Tigers received two players, Paul Richan or Rickan, I I don't really know how to say his name, and Alex Lang. So, uh, Chase, are you surprised Castellanos was dealt? Let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, I can't say, well, okay, here's what I'm going to say with that. I'm surprised that Castellanos was dealt, but I'm not upset about it. So we talked about it on last week's episode, the fact that Castellanos, out of the three, uh, you know, potential pieces of the deadline, that, you know, Castellanos made the most sense to trade. So I think that <clears throat> Castellanos, uh, getting anything for Castellanos in return, I think is a win uh, because the Tigers didn't really think they were going to get much out of him. His trade value wasn't super high, but they ended up finding a trade partner. It ended up working out really well, so I'm excited that the Tigers were actually able to get some decent prospects in return uh, for Castellanos. I don't necessarily know if they'll they'll pan out, but it's definitely always interesting to see, uh, you know, how prospects end up turning out. But I think it's it's definitely good. I, I like that they traded Nick Castellanos uh, as much as I did like uh, Nick on the team. I just think it was his time to go. He just didn't, you know, he he wasn't really happy with the team and. It didn't really seem like the team was on the same page with him, so I think it was kind of good for him in his career for a fresh start somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we discussed it last week. Cassianos was the guy that we expected both to go. Uh, One, because of the way his contract is set up. You know, he is in his late 20s, right? And he's going to demand a certain kind of salary, and he's going to take up a spot. And who knows if the, you know, I mean, the Tigers aren't going to be good during that time, right? So it's kind of wasted money. Um, And you would have liked to see him maybe traded last year or something to get a little more value out of him. Uh, But the two guys that they got aren't necessarily that bad. So we got Paul Rickan, and he was the 78th pick in the 2018 draft. And it's another pitcher, which let's, let's talk about pitchers, right? Uh, everyone in the Tigers minor league system, I feel like, is a pitcher, don't you? Yeah, they do have an overload of pitchers, which isn't a bad thing. As bad as the you know the the pitching staff has been for the Tigers this season, especially in the bullpen, I think having pitchers is good. But it gets to a point where you know you almost have too many, and it's kind of hard to keep track of everyone. Yeah, I, yeah, and you know when you're stockpiling on pitchers, right? Like I understand. Pitchers go really early in the amateur draft because they're like a hot commodity, right? Like, it's it's hard to find a good slam dunk pitcher. It just simply is. They're the toughest things uh, to find in baseball just because, like, you're betting on 18 to 22-year-old kids that just might not pan out. You know, I, practically everyone gets Tommy John. So it's like you might not have seen them post Tommy John. Uh, so I think that it's really a crapshoot with pitchers. So I, I'm not down on Rickon, but... He has a good changeup, which is always encouraging, um, but he needs more than just a fastball and a changeup. So if the curveball or the slider develops, um, he'll continue to rack up the strikeouts, uh, which might be good. I, I think he can be a starting pitcher, but he's probably going to do some relief work, I think. 
Um, so he's just kind of all over the place. He's like an average guy to above average. Like in college, his fastball was was decent. Okay, he was hitting like mid nineties, like up to ninety five, which is good good velocities for a college guy. Um, but it's kind of been in the high eighties and low nineties, and it's like clocked up as high as like ninety two or ninety three. But I just I think when you got have a guy with like a a low nineties fastball, a good changeup and maybe a curveball or slider, and you want him to start, I don't, like, I know he fits there because he's got the stamina, but I, I don't know. Like, I could see him maybe in the fifth spot, but he, I think he's more likely uh, to make it in, like, two or three years in the bullpen for the Tigers. So, like, overall, is that the kind of haul that you want for Nicholas Castellanos, who mashes against left fielders? Uh, I mean, left-handed pitchers? Like... I don't know. You know what I mean? Uh, and then yeah. Lang is also a pitcher. And I guess he's a little, I don't know, a little better than the than Rick Hand because he's, uh, he's tall. He's a six foot three guy. Um, he was drafted 30th in the 2017 draft. And he instantly pops up as number 21 on Detroit's prospect list. So that's, like, encouraging, right? Like, you get, like, a top 30 guy in your own farm it's kind of bolstering the farm which is what this is all about because at the end of the day Cassianos wasn't going to get much in trade value because like I said he would have been better a year ago but right now I mean he's he's a free agent after the season so you know Lang is probably someone uh to get excited about but you're probably not going to see either of these guys until Maybe like September call-ups of next year, and then they could have potential at spring training possibly. So, I, you know, with that in mind, is that the best haul you could get for Nicholas Castellanos, and are you happy with that trade? Overall, I think, you know, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it because, you know, just because they got something for him, I guess, when his trade value was pretty low. I can't say it's the best overall thing they probably could have gotten. Like, like you mentioned, the, you know, the pitching. Uh, you know, when you're stacking up at pitches like this, it's kind of hard to get some of those position players, and mm-hmm. uh, you start to lose focus on that a little bit. But I think it was still a pretty good haul for for what they were kind of expecting. I feel like a lot of people were expecting they, the Tigers weren't going to make any moves in the deadline. So the fact that they made this one, uh, I think, was pretty good. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree. It, it's all... You know, I think the big the big thing here is is, is Lang. If he works out, because he's at the Double A level right now, um, and he's twenty three, so he you know he he has the potential to like he's not going to be great, but he has the potential to become solid, and that's what the Tigers need to start building consistency at the major league level. Because fans are you know frankly sick of it, right? I mean, each week you know the, last week they went two and three, this week they'll go two and three. Um, they just lost to the White Sox. I mean, they're putting up a fight, and they seem a little, you know, it's it's young guys fighting for spots, so it's a little bit of a renewed energy uh, after the trades, but I don't know, man. Like, they really need to get some of these guys up there quick because I just don't, I just don't know how long fans are going to take it. But overall, like you said, I, I'm going to give this, I'm going to mark this down as a win for the Tigers because, you know, Cassianos had to go. So they got rid of him, and I'm happy that he gets to play uh, in Chicago with the Cubs at Wrigley Field. Um, you know, he he wanted to be in a pennant race. Uh, he wanted to be on a competitive team. He's going to hit more home runs in Chicago. I mean, you know, he's out of – we talked about the Comerica Park comments last week. So he's out of that ballpark. Um, it was just kind of – you know, at certain points, if things just get so bad within an organization that it affects the players – and he needed out, and and he got out. So mm-hmm. I think it's a win for both sides, honestly. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's hard feelings, even though I'm sure some people are going to jump to that conclusion. Um, but I, I just think it was a happy, you know, parting. Um, they posted a little, you know, thank you, Nicholas uh, type deal. So uh, that's really the Cassianos thing. So we're going to both mark that, that one down as a win. So that will bring us to our second story of the day. Uh, Shane Green being sent to the Atlanta Braves. Uh, what about this one? We, I know we talked about it last week, but were you, were you shocked when you saw his name pop up? 
This one, yeah, I was a little bit shocked when I saw this one. It's because, you know, we mentioned this last week. I think this was the player out of all three of them that we really, I think, unanimously wanted to keep. Um, because, you know, Green did have a lot of value, and that's, you know, and that's obviously why he was traded because he, he you know, he had the value, but he also served a really good purpose for the Tigers. I mean, it's hard to find a really good closer like that. And, um, you know, I thought that they might hold on to Green out of the three that were available. Um, they ended up holding on to Boyd out of the three, which is fine. I, I really like Matt Boyd as well. He serves a good purpose mm-hmm. for the Tigers as well. Um, but I think the main issue I had with the Shane Green trade was just the return. And I think a lot of people were also confused on the return on this one. I feel like they, a lot of people thought that the Braves kind of fleeced the Tigers in terms of uh, kind of the return on, on their investment. Do you kind of want to, you know, elaborate that on a, a little bit? Yeah. So I, I did see one article that actually written by like, you know, a Braves fan blog type deal. Um, and, and they were saying, you know, kind of like, you know, Braves get Shane Green for a decent cost. So who they wound up trading for, or trading for Shane Green, is Joey Wentz, who was the 40th pick in 2016, and Travis Demerit, who was the 30th pick in 2013. So we'll start with Demerit. Um, he's 24 years old. He's an outfielder. Uh, he was a first-round prospect, but when you have a first-round prospect that's 24 years old and still in the minor leagues, you start to question what exactly happened. He hit two, he slashed 266, 361, 554 in 2016, but he also managed to strike out 175 times in 123 games. So there was questions about his eye at the plate. In 2017 and 2018, he struggled to make contact, and he got on base less than a, a third of his plate appearances. But he was still flashing some of his raw power, and he hit 32 home runs. So there's lots of potential here, and I'm actually impressed with what I saw because I you know the tone that you took um you know when we started talking about this trade uh is the one that I had immediately once it was made but Demerit got a hit and scored a run in his first game and he's going to stay up with the club for the rest of the season I I believe I mean it's only a, you know a couple more weeks until rosters expand so I don't really see him uh taking a demotion you know they they traded for an outfielder and they got an outfielder He's someone who could possibly hit 20-plus home runs a year if he taps into that power game that we talked about. Um, and, and I think his fielding is is average. He's got some decent speed, but it's really going to be about discipline. So if the Tigers hitting coach can work with him and teach him how to have a major league eye, and it, and it really helps that a guy like Miguel Cabrera is the veteran on the team. If Miguel can step into that leadership role, and teach like he has a legendary eye like if he doesn't swing nine nine out of ten times the umpire is going to call it a ball because Miguel Cabrera just he, he's got the one of the best eyes of all time in baseball so that's something that he could really help demerit with um and this guy could actually turn out to be a decent uh trade piece you know considering that Cassiano I mean not Cassianos but Shane Green is turning 30 uh you know, that's when pitchers' arms start to go, and he is a bit streaky. So I'm actually going to flip my position from last week, and I hope no one calls me out for being contradictory, but I, I, I actually am okay with this, and I also think that Joey Wentz is going to be good. He's another pitcher, so I understand why uh, people are kind of down on that, but he's 6'5", 210, so he's a big boy. And, uh, you know, I always mention height if they're over 6'2", 6'3", because I, I think that you know, the taller you are, the more you get that arc when you bring your hand right over the top. So it just helps with the deceiving and that long action. Um, you know, he jumped right on to number six of the prospect list, according to fan graphs. So, you know, this is a guy who's being compared to Cole Hamels on draft day. So I, I'm not like, I'm not sure that this is upsetting. It's just that he's taken a dip, but this kid threw 96 in high school. So if they can develop him and move him, I mean, he can be a nice piece as well. Um, you know, it's kind of like Bo Burrows. Bo Burrows struggled back in 2015, and he dealt with, like, a spine tilt uh, that caused him to kind of d- uh, change his delivery, and that's also something that Wentz is dealing with. Um, so we'll see what the – you know, he's a work in progress. So 
you know, I, I guess it sounds like I'm saying that both of these guys are yet to be determined, but I'm kind of up on them uh, when just a few days ago I was really down on them. But, you know, tell me what you think about them. I mean, you know, I'm going to trust you on, on your aspect of the fact that these are good prospects. Like like I mentioned, you follow the Tigers a lot more than I do. Um, I saw the demerit, the demerit kid, uh, you know, he, like you mentioned, he got that hit and ended up scoring around. I think I saw a highlight from the Tigers game tonight. As Scored again as tonight, as yeah. yeah. Jake Rogers hit him in. Exactly. And Jake so, Rogers is another player yeah. we talked about last week. And just, you know, I know he hit his first career homer and – He's been an exciting player like to watch. Like his fourth so at bat, I think. So. Yeah, so he's been an exciting addition to the roster. And I think just having some new, fresh faces is, is kind of fun. I know how many people were excited when Jake Rogers got called up. And Demerit kind of, you know, starting off hot in Detroit is is good for, you know, Tigers fans to sort of be confident and sort of uh, liking this trade a little bit more. Um, so I definitely think that's interesting. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention um, – before we head into another segment with the Tigers, but I know there was some rumors kind of going around on Twitter. I know we kind of talk about rumors, but uh-huh. um, but I heard that a lot of people were upset with Al Avila because there was a report that came out that said that at one point the Tigers were offered uh, Javier Baez. Yeah, Javier Baez, my, and they also Javi had a Baez. chance to get Alex Bregman. Exactly. Yeah, and I so, think Anthony Fennick reported that, but I'm not gonna say that for certain because I, I, I heard I I've seen it on Twitter. Um, I've been real busy this week. I graduated from college, so I was busy celebrating that with my family and getting through uh, graduation with a 90 year old grandmother. So I wasn't able to read that story yet, but I, I've been meaning to. Um, so without diving too deep into it. Um, this totally sounds plausible, man. Like, Al Avila sucks, in my opinion. And, like, not as a guy. I don't know him as a guy. But, actually, I do know that he would trade his own son. So, he might suck as a guy, too. Um, <laughs> but, no, he he's just, like, yeah. I, I, I totally can see um, him missing those guys. Um, the, the question I have and the thing I won't speculate on is, is when – at what point in time were these trades on the table? Because, yeah. like, I think that's okay, we're talking part. about prospects, okay? So, yeah. and my thing with prospects is you really don't know in baseball. I mean, unless you've yeah. been a scout mm-hmm. for decades, and even those guys get it wrong. It's just mm-hmm. like a crapshoot at a certain point, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, like, my general rule is only the top five to ten picks are safe, you know? Yeah. No, I completely understand what you're saying. And I so, think that was a big argument that yeah. people were bringing up on Twitter in response, which is the fact that, when the Tigers had Michael Fulmer, and, yeah, and the trades they, were for Michael you know, Fulmer, yeah, and that's what I'm saying. They had they thought they had a future Cy Young pitcher in their hand, and yeah, they I did have they a future Cy Young pitcher yeah. under him. He he won the Rookie of the Year. He was an outstanding pitcher in his rookie year, and he didn't have any of those injuries yet. And then he started to dip, and now he has the injury, and now you question if he can be a number one, and he's looking to be maybe a two or you know a three. So it, mm-hmm. it's you know. Talk about it in hindsight, of course. You know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. So, yeah, w- would it be nice if we had, if if the Tigers had Alex Bregman or Javi Baez or Javi instead Baez. of Michael Homer? Sure, yeah, sure, yes. In a perfect world, absolutely. But you know, nothing's perfect in this world, and I, I don't want to say like I don't like this kind of reporting because I would do this story, but. This kind of thing only stirs up a fan base that's already really, really mad. Um, yeah, I and, know what And saying. I think that, you know, it's it's aimed right at Al Avila. So, yeah, people are pissed mm-hmm. at Al Avila. Um, but, you know, lots of people haven't liked him for a long time. And I don't think he just got, what, like a three-year extension? So I, it's not – this isn't changing anything. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not going away anytime soon. So <laughs> No, no. So – yeah, that's just kind of a – yeah, that, that's my piece on that. Once I read that article, maybe I'll have something to say about it next week. I, did you see uh, Fennec and Chris McCoskey going at it on Twitter too? Yeah, I saw that on Twitter. <laughs> I was like, what in the world was that? And I think that was sur- that surrounded the, that whole conversation about the yeah. Javi Baez and Fennec, Alex Pegman Yeah, stories. Fennec comes off as so pompous. I mean, I think McCoskey's questioning 
uh, the sources or something, and you know, and it, I don't know. Go go check it out on Twitter if you want. Um, but man, that that was crazy. Journal journalists getting at each other's throats. So what? It's it's Fennec and McCoskey this year, and it was Mario and Rod last year. Who's it going to be yeah, next year? Right? Like the say, radio yeah, guys. Yeah, lots of yeah, a whole lot of beef going around in the Tigers uh, organization here. I think just maybe we'll not feud a lot next of... year. Yeah, <laughs> maybe we'll go at it. We already feud enough, so that'd be good. I'd do <laughs> yeah. that. All right. So that's enough uh, on the individual trades. I guess we should talk about for our third story the just overall tone now of the minor league system okay so we talked about jake rogers uh jake rogers has moved up to the mlb he was the seventh uh ranked guy on the tigers pipeline list but it looks like he's up up for good but if grayson griner comes back he's still on the uh injured list there's a chance that Rodgers could go back to Toledo, but with the way he's playing, man, I, I I don't see him going back. He's impressed. I mean, we talked about him a little bit. Is there anything else you want to say about him? Um, I mean, like I said, I mean, I know there's a lot of fans who are really excited about him, and I think it's one of those things where, uh, when it comes to the Red Wings, I feel you know I share a very similar uh, thought process. Just let the young kids play. I mean, we're at the point in the season where the Tigers are looking so awful. But play um, at the major league level. See, I, I I'm big on letting them develop at their own pace at the level. Of I the understand. Yeah, and I understand what where you're coming from with that. And, you know, like I said, obviously the guys have to develop. But I think it was one of those things where Rogers is, like you mentioned, playing really well on the main yeah, roster. Yeah, he, he's and, earning a spot for sure, especially yeah, with exactly. the expanded rosters coming up. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that's the kind of thing. Sometimes, as much as you want to have guys develop in the minors, there's some guys who. You know, you give trials, and, you know, maybe he's not a mainstay for the entire season, but the fact that he got a trial run, he did well, means uh, good things for his future. But I think, you know, like I said, let the kid play. Let him play up on the main roster. Give the Tigers fans something to look forward to when they're watching because I know there has not been a lot of (laughs) stuff to look forward to during the season in terms of the Tigers' play. So getting to see an exciting player like Jake Rogers up on the main roster, I think, is giving some, you know, people – reasons to tune in i think yeah i I, i'm pro jake rogers i say he stays up the rest of the season the kid's doing well i like him i think the fans like him so i don't know why you wouldn't go with him he's one of the few offensive young guys that the tigers have and you know let the kids play like you said and then of course you have casey mize who had his rehab rehab starts um you know he's getting there he's doing well the you know Erie went like six and two this week, so they played eight games you know over a seven day period, so that's always impressive, and they won most of them. Um, but actually, one of the big reasons for that is I think Isaac Paredes hit over like five hundred. He's really seen the ball well, and he's he's a guy that I'm never really sure about, um, and I don't I don't know exactly. You know what I mean, like. If he was worth it, I think uh, they got him in the Cubs trade for Justin Wilson and Alex Avila a few years ago. Uh, he just looks to me to be like an average infielder, which I don't like. You know, it, that's like a Jamer Candelario deal. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Right so, but he's he's really stroking. I'm looking for the stat right now, but he, he's really stroking the ball. Uh, well. Yeah, he hit 550 this week, and he's hitting 330 since the beginning of July. So, and, and on top of that, Cam Gibson and Derek Hill had good weeks too. So people are hitting, uh, which is always encouraging because you know my main complaint is that you're, there's too many pitchers in this system. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to complain about Casey Mize or Matt Manning. Uh, Tariq Schoolball has been pretty good in my opinion. We talked about his flirtation with a no hitter uh, just I think a week ago, right? Yeah, I think so. I think it was last week. Of course, there's Alex Fado who come out of Florida. Um, he's he's I wanted him to be better than he is, but we'll see how that goes. And of course, you know Joey Wentz kind of rounds out the top ten, and then Riley Green is number three on that list. So you know there's some offensive talent, but for the most part, it's pitching, and I just don't really know. Like if that pitching gets called up who's going to get called up to hit for them, right? Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. They need offense. Like, they desperately mm-hmm. – they just traded yeah. Nick Castellanos. So, like, yeah. 
I think when Jake Rogers hit his first career home run, his war moved up to become third on the team. Wow. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> that's what I'm saying is, like, they're abysmal. Oh, like, man. Uh, abysmal. So. Yeah. And like I mentioned, not a lot of fun, you know, there's not a whole lot of reasons to watch the Tigers right now. Uh, shout out to all you diehard fans out there. Yeah, right. uh, I definitely couldn't do it. <laughs> the, uh... That makes me sound like a bad fan, but, <laughs> you know, it's not that I only watch when they're winning. That's not what I'm trying to put forth. I still follow the games, and it's tough because I don't really get any of the games down here on TV. But um, if the games were on, like if they actually had them down here, I, I'd, turn, I'd probably turn them on. But it's just one of those things where I, have I don't to really give know you if I... MLB TV password or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll have to get some sort of subscription service to that or whatever. But you know, I it's it's unfortunate, it really is, because Tigers fans, you know, they deserve a lot better for the dedication that they they put forth. So yeah, I I hear you. Um, the uh, the other thing that I want to mention about the minor leagues, just a couple more things actually. Uh, Lakeland only played four games this week. They won all four of them, which is encouraging. But the Flying yeah. Tigers got rained out for most of the week. And, you know, I think we mentioned it on here. I, I live in Orlando, and it has certainly been wet. We're getting – there's little things that keep forming out in the Atlantic, and they're coming over to us. And they're not big, you know. They they dissipate before they hit land, but they, like – we get little bands of crap, and it's just making life so annoying, but – that's what it's like in summer. So it's not always sunny here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they did manage to win all four games that they played. So I thought that was worth mentioning. And the second thing that I wanted to say was that Edwin Jackson, you remember Edwin Jackson? He's, like, ancient. Yes. Mm-hmm. He played with the Tigers, mm-hmm. like, ten years ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> he's back with the team. He's still in Toledo. I have to assume that he gets called up to start eventually, right? Um, yeah. But he made a second start. Uh, this week and he made it through five innings he only gave up two runs he was still he still gave up hits uh you know gave up six hits two walks so he's not a like he's you know he's never been known for his control or anything i think he threw a no hitter Mm -hmm. once with like a bunch of walks or something stupid you know so like (laughs) (laughs) he threw like 150 pitches because he walked so many people but, uh, you know, and he only struck out one guy. So, like, I'm okay with leaving him at the AAA level. I don't really know where the Tigers signed him. Maybe they thought they needed someone in case they traded Boyd. But that's not the case. Um, and I think the last thing we should probably talk about is just kind of to briefly go over what the prospects that the Tigers just got, how they did this week, because I'm sure people want to know that, right? Oh yeah, I mean, when you, I'm someone who hadn't really heard a whole lot about these prospects, so to hear anything about them, I think I just want to hear some good news about, uh, you know, some of the prospects the Tigers got in return. Yeah. Okay. So Wentz and Lang debuted in Erie, and Wentz mm-hmm. started, and Lang uh, was in relief, like I mentioned. Uh, so, uh, he gave up one run, and it was on a solo home run, and then Lang you know, relieved him and he gave up one run on two innings. So that's all I got for you. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I, 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 small sample size, (laughs) they gave up runs, you know, I'm sure I always like to see a guy come in and just, you know, shut the door in his first, especially a relief guy, right? Like, you know, Mm -hmm. give him an inning, get him, you know, one, two, three. If he gives up a hit in the second inning, take him out. I don't really know what happened there, but you know, two runs, uh, two innings, not always great, or one run, yeah. two innings, not great. But um, we'll see how they do. Like I said, it's a work in progress. They're gonna take longer. Wentz will probably take longer uh, than Lang. And then uh, Rick Ann was in Lakeland as a starter, but he kind of sucked. So he gave up six runs, five <laughs> earned. <laughs> so maybe these aren't good trades, Chase. Maybe I lied to you. I'm just. Maybe we're, maybe I'm sorry. I just looked this up while we were recording because I figured it was something people wanted to know, and this is this is discouraging to say the least. Um, <laughs> well, no. at, least at least Demerit looks pretty good in the main roster, right? Yeah, I I did. I was up on Demerit, and you know, I think you know Wentz. I guess one run and a solo home run is is encouraging. Uh, it was only like five innings, so we'll see how he goes. Or, 
But, yep, that's the Tigers minor league system. Any any questions, Chase? I know you're an avid no, I think Tigers good. fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think I'm good. I mean, honestly, that was a good kind of update. I don't necessarily know how it makes you feel about the prospects the Tigers got rid of. <laughs> yeah, it's, but, uh, I'm, I'm more happy that they got rid of Castellanos. I mean, that get yeah. rid of is the wrong way to put it, that they were able to – uh, make the situation work and get something in return for Castellanos, who likely would have left in the off season. Which, you know, <laughs> imagine fan how how pissed fans would have been if they just let him go, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. Yeah. And he's gonna you getting know, nothing for him. Yeah, getting something for him is better than getting nothing. And like let's see what he can do in the playoff race to you know boost his salary. The Tigers aren't in play for him, so I'm all for him making a bunch of money. I don't care who pays him. Oh, by the way, so for anyone who had watched the Cubs or followed wanted to follow Nick Cassiano, he actually hit his first home run with the with the Cubs today. Yes, he did. And um, it would have also been a home run in Comerica Park. So, <laughs> 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 just thought I would point that out for anyone trying to defend Cassiano's statements there. But no, no bad blood. Just a little fun. To take a little jab at what his comments were. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, we took up the first half of the show talking about the Tigers, so let's talk about some other uh, Michigan sports stuff. Our fourth story today is kind of about the Lions. Chase, you want to do it? Yeah, so uh, if you guys are you know kind of following the, the Lions the cornerback situation, it wasn't necessarily a swap, but if the, the Lions ended up signing uh, Ra- former Raiders cornerback uh, Rashawn Melvin in the offseason, and then the Raiders went and signed former... Uh, Lions cornerback Nevin Lawson, um, and it looks like the Lions got the better half of this exchange, even though that wasn't a one-for-one trade. But Nevin Lawson was actually uh, suspended today uh, on, I believe it was a uh, he tested po- or he failed a drug test, I should say. He tested positive for he tested a positive banned for substance. banned substance. Yeah, for banned substance, and apparently, according to Lawson on his, he was either Twitter or Instagram on his social media, whatever he updated on, mm-hmm. he. Um, apparently took a substance on the banned list. Yeah, he unknowingly NFL. ingested Osterine. So Osterine is Osterine, something. that's what it was, yeah. Yeah, Osterine is like, it, it is a PED, but I'll tell you, uh, you know, I cover professional wrestling and mixed martial arts for Michigan Sports and Entertainment, our site. Uh, so if you haven't read the, those articles, go check those out at this website. Um, but... Osterine is something that comes up in UFC a lot during these drug tests. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite fighters, who's now a wrestler, uh, you know, got his career ruined by unknowingly ingesting Osterine. Um, and what I can say is that it can come from, like, meat. It can come from tainted supplements. Um, and, that you know, to, to be honest, there's a list of supplements that are allowed that athletes take because, you know, they're all about, you know, making their body the best that it can be. Um, so it's possible that he took something that he thought he was allowed to take and it had something in it. Um, so he's probably going to appeal this. I think he has a chance to win because I believe there's recent evidence based on an MMA, uh, UFC decision with USADA that, uh, Osterine can pulse. Um, so what that means is if you've ingested it, at some point, uh, it can test negative, 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 and then pop back up. Um, but it's really just coming back up from that original test because once it's in you, some of it's in you forever. Um, and the testing limitations are really low. So all of that kind of needs to come out. But this is a pretty interesting story. Um, so <laughs> Lions won that not trade trade, right? <laughs> yeah, so all right, I, I, so with the whole Nevin Lawson situation, I kind of want to read some of his comments that he released on his social media. He said, um, to kind of summarize, he said, uh, specifically the substance is Osterine, which I've never knowingly taken. Unfortunately, it does not matter, as I am responsible for knowing every single ingredient that goes in my body, and I apparently failed in this regard. So it sounds like, you know, whatever supplement he chose to make, uh, or take, I should say, uh, he ended up, you know, not unknowingly taking Osterine, and... Uh, As in the NFL, they have a no-tolerance policy uh, where you have to know everything that's going in your body when you're taking it, whether that be supplements or any kind of food or dietary um, thing that's going into your body. Um, You think he'll appeal? 
I don't think he'll appeal. I think he'll serve the suspension. It sounds like in his Four statement. Games. Yeah, and another player, I guess, do we? I'm not sure if we covered it, but a Golden t- former Lion Golden Tate also oh, yeah. received a four game suspension for uh, what did he do uh, for for drugs? He ended up taking, um, I think it was a drug that was supposed to boost like he wanted to have kids. I think it boosted like fertility. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, fertility. And there was a there was it's something in in the banned substance, and he, I believe, he is appealing. He thinks that he is a very strong case i believe his case is set to be heard later this week um if i'm not mistaken but so the we'll giants and golden week. tate yeah so golden tate and the giants are very confident that he has a strong case that he's going to be able to overcome this and uh beat his four game suspension but it sounds like for an evan lawson it sounds like he's just going to take a suspension and not try to appeal uh i know the appeal process is is difficult and um i feel like it sounds like golden tate has a better chance here than uh ne- mr nevin lawson but um as i mentioned that stuff is always kind of a tough break uh i think we kind of you know i want to sort of delve into a, a bigger subject here um about the whole you know drug policy because obviously they do the whole no tolerance um and it's an instant four game suspension for anyone caught using um, banned substances and obviously there are cases where you know there are straight just you know uh performance enhancing drugs being taken um you know like steroids are not i wouldn't say not very common but you know they're they still exist um but yeah you're slapped with an instant four game suspension i believe in the mlb it ranges anywhere from like what like 40 to 80 game suspension if i'm not mistaken so they've got all sorts of rules but i think the main issue i have here with the nfl is just the fact that um, if you guys have been following the NFL at all, uh, star wide receiver of the Kansas City Chiefs, Tyree Kill, um, was recorded um, making very disturbing comments to his fiance or his girlfriend. I can't remember what she is in relation to him. Um, and then there were reports that he also uh, broke his child's arm, and there were voice recordings of that too, and and evidence that you know that he possibly you know hurt his child and. Um, Tyreek Hill served no suspension whatsoever. He was let off scot-free, so to speak, um, and he will play during the 2019-2020 season. Um, and to me, that's just upsetting. Um, when a player accidentally takes or unknowingly takes, you know, a banned substance, it's an instant four-game suspension. You know, the appeal process is very difficult. Most of the time, players lose the appeal, and they have to serve a four-game suspension. But I just don't understand why smaller things like marijuana and unknowing substance is treated more seriously than domestic violence and other things like that. Um, to me, it's frustrating because of how inconsistent the NFL's uh, discipline policies have been. Um, I think it's just one of those things where they have treated some situations correctly and in other situations they have treated completely wrong. Well, I think the inconsistencies there are my main issue with that whole issue. I'm not here to play devil's advocate entirely, but no, but I mean, if you I have, will if explain you the yeah. I will explain the logic behind it, at least in my head. Okay, so we're talking about domestic abuse. Yes, and domestic abuse is number one terrible, right? Anyone yes. mm-hmm. who is guilty of it should be condemned, but. You have to be guilty of it. And yeah, sure. for the NFL to make a policy based on accusation alone um, probably wasn't acceptable mainstream, especially among football fans. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would say like just a few years ago, you know, like this is something that I think is very recently uh, gone it, you know, in, into the bigger picture. So I, I think that it's up for debate when they, they need to go over their discipline policy. But like, you know, when they made these rules, it was, I think it's based off the, uh, you know, idea in America that you're innocent until proven guilty. And, yeah, I understand. And, 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 I understand to, and to take someone's pay away, to take someone's, you know, because people would get just as mad if he got suspended with pay. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, like, th- and that's what I'm saying is like it, it's hard. 
Because if you're wrong, it it's you know it's tough. But the you know yeah, the idea is, is like the idea yeah. is is who's gonna lie about this? But then again, I don't think anyone's coming forward with it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the tapes so, were just leaked. Yes, the tapes were leaked. There was nothing. That she, I don't think the woman. I, I don't know if she ever filed a lawsuit. Or, I think she filed or something and then took. it I think back. she filed something. Yeah, and I'm sure that was probably dealt with. You know. Out, yeah. You know. And like I said, the whole story is disturbing and it's worth looking into. But I don't know that the NFL is going to make a policy um, that that essentially, you know, kind of puts guilt on the person, right? Like, you know, it it now changes it to guilty until proven innocent, which isn't the way the country is supposed to work. So I'm not saying I agree with it, but I I get where they're coming from. I just think that... um, the te- like, you know, some of these like marijuana laws and not, I mean, not laws, but well, laws have changed too. But I mean, the policy needs to change. You know what I mean? Like it's recuperative yeah, at this no, point. No. There are athletes that uh, no. advocate for it. So I don't understand why it's such a big and like Ritalin, like some people need that. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. There are, you know, and there, so maybe they just need to look at their, their substance abuse policy. Maybe the discipline policy. Yeah. The, it's, they have a weird, like. You know, it, it's not that um, – like I don't necessarily think they're handling the the domestic abuse situation in the worst way possible. Mm-hmm. But it definitely seems that way because they are handling the less, you know, drastic things in the worst way possible by making yeah. them seem so much more important. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So it's yeah. just by no, comparison. I, I things look really bad. Uh, but mm-hmm. it's worth, you know, addressing and, you know, it's yeah. going to take someone to speak up and go like, look, like we don't want guys to play in the league that are accused of this sort of thing because you exactly. shouldn't even put yourself in a situation. You know what I mean? But unfortunately, athletes are never going to learn that lesson. I don't know what it is because, um, you know, I, I know there's plenty of athletes that have been through it that, will you know, they do seminars and stuff with the rookies and say, like, look, this is like this is it now. This is your life. People are going to try to hurt you, spin things. Like, you have to be really careful with everything you do. And then they put themselves in these terrible situations. So it's like, just be a good person. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and that's what I'm saying. I mean, obviously, these things are, are tough, and I completely agree. I mean, that it's obviously innocent until proven guilty. Um, but I, I just think there was uh, – I know they're, they said there was enough evidence, and, you know, the voice recordings just were kind of leaked. They were never really – you know, use as as true evidence yeah. in the case. At a at, um, at a certain so, point, they wanted it to go back to the like assistant, uh, you know, DA or something, mm-hmm. or the DA himself. But I just I think nothing came of it. And unfortunately, if nothing comes of it, how can you punish someone? You know what I mean? Like he exactly. has the argument no, that I, was I like, wait, oh, you know, like anyone can accuse me, which is true. But why would anyone accuse you? Is yeah, all, you know, exactly. is the bigger question. So there's. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that all you wanted to talk about with the discipline policy? Yeah, I think that was all I really wanted to talk about. I just, you know, like I said, that that was just sort of me airing my a little bit of my frustrations with that. Um, obviously, you know, it, it's going to be such a tough, you know, it's sort of going to be a hot button topic to talk about, and obviously, there's good arguments for both sides. So, um, but it, it's definitely something I think the NFL just needs to look at in general. Just look at their substance abuse policy and just look at the way they handle those situations and. Um, just maybe handle them a little bit differently instead of, you know. Yeah, and, and, and to put a positive spin on it, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they will address it uh, within yeah. the next couple of years because I think that it is with the times now. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's unfortunate that it wasn't <laughs> in the past, but now it is. Um, so hopefully they address that and, you know, there's a little more decency within the league. Um, yeah, but that's it for our fourth story. It kind of was a lion story. So for our fifth story, Chase, I know you want to talk about um, some comments that David Griffin made on LeBron James. Yeah, so if you guys are unfamiliar with who David Griffin is, uh, he's the former Cleveland Cavaliers general manager. Um, And I talked about some of his comments on our Twitter at MSE Countdown. You guys aren't following over there. Um, But his first comment about LeBron James was that uh, he's with an inter- in an interview with a Sports Illustrated, he said that LeBron is getting all of the credit and none of the blame, and that's not fun for people. They don't like being a part of that world. 
And this is what he described apparently is the challenge of building around LeBron James. <laughs> and I kind of want to discuss some of the, the, the controversy here because – Right off the bat, it sounds crazy. <laughs> yeah, the I mean, before you before around... you go into it, this just sounds incredibly whiny. But yeah, I'll refrain until I hear his comments. Go ahead. So, let's, so let me so let me just jump into my first impressions here. So my comment is just off the bat: the challenge of building around LeBron James. So you're gonna you're gonna tell me as a general manager in the NBA. You are going to complain about building around possibly the best player in NBA history. I'm saying possibly because I know there's, uh, you know, you know <laughs> well, we're not going to get into that conversation right Jordan. now. I don't have to agree to disagree with you right now, but I'm just saying Jordan. possibly because it's, it's because it's open. Just because you're 12 doesn't mean you get Anyways. to go ahead and claim LeBron as the goat. All right, <laughs> Be- all right. One of you said one of the greatest players in the world. I'll give you that. Go yeah, I ahead. said one. Okay, okay, one of the greatest players in NBA history. Yeah, and, and you're complaining about the issues of building around building around him. Yeah. Um, and just as a general manager, LeBron James so you David Griffin, LeBron James is your entire legacy. If I know so if David Griffin right now, he is the general manager of the New Orleans Pelicans and they just drafted Zion Williamson. He was in charge of drafting Zion Williamson. I think any GM could have gone out there and drafted. Zion Jeez, Williams, if I'm if it. I'm Zion, I, that's a giant red flag. Yeah, so he's the I'm next saying. LeBron. Like, he is the next. I'm Zion Williamson is the next LeBron James, and I think you know. But right now, we don't know how Zion's going to turn. I think we kind of do. Yeah, we do. But, he's um, he's going to be one do. of we the know, greatest you know players how, of this generation. Yeah, yeah he's going to be good. I'm not. All right, we had a small technical glitch, but we're back. Chase, we were talking about Zion Williamson being the next LeBron James and how that doesn't bode well with Griffin's comments. Yeah, so my impressions of that are just essentially that, for right now, we know how Zion's going to turn out. He's going to be a great general generational player down the road, but that's not really what we're talking about right now because David Griffin, as of right now, his entire legacy in the NBA is having LeBron James a part of, as a part of the Cleveland Cavaliers and winning and him carrying the team to a championship is it not no that's absolutely I mean, what it is yeah so that's what i'm saying it's does anyone know david griffin's where, name if it isn't for lebron james exactly you don't know and, who david griffin is and, and this man has the audacity to go out there and talk about oh well it was it was tougher than you think woe is me i'm gonna play the victim like this is some like okay. fourth grade crap this is <laughs> this is I understand why you're upset. <laughs> so I'm gonna so I wanna read one more of his comments. So he said everything we did was so inorganic and unsustainable and frankly not fun. I was miserable. Literally the moment we won the championship, I knew I was gonna leave. There was no way I was gonna stay for any amount of money was his comment. Well, good. Following. I'm glad he's gone. I, I mean, yeah. if I'm the New Orleans owner, though, I'm thinking like, Jesus, I could get out of here. Like, yeah. <laughs> but so my issue with that is just the fact that it's like, oh, this situation just sounds like, hey, I'm gonna win a championship with LeBron and then leave. <laughs> Essentially, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get my money, I'm gonna get my championship, and move on to something else once LeBron's done in, in Cleveland. Yeah. Essentially, what he That's said my was initial like, impression. well, we we got LeBron back, and then. We had to do a bunch of stuff to win a championship, and that was not not sustainable because it left me with nothing because we knew LeBron was going to leave, so I was going to leave. Like, you know. Yeah. So, but, so here's my thing. I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate to my own point here. Oh, my God. Um, and I'm going to kind of contradict. I know. I know it sounds kind of crazy. I, I understand where he's coming from with the rebuilding. So my thing is the fact that if you know anything about LeBron James, LeBron James is not a very big magnet. If you think about it, LeBron James has never really been – he hasn't really been someone who pulls stars into a team, if you think about it. The Cavaliers didn't really – I mean, yes, had Kyrie. Kyrie was the one big star that he pulled in. Yep. And I'll, I'll, they, I'll he didn't that. pull him in. He, they drafted him, and then LeBron came and took over his team, and LeBron drove him out. So, Yeah, so that's the thing. That's that's my – so he has – so he had Kyrie, which is obviously – you know, he was – he was good with the Cavaliers, and you know that's that's where it was. But then, okay, he he joins Dwayne Wade's team with the Heat, right? 
and then he and then he joins LA and then sure he pulls Anthony Davis. Yeah, but, but Paul George I and all say, those other guys didn't but, go with yeah, him. Yeah, exactly. He trade they traded for Anthony Davis. Not okay. like Anthony Davis in the off season was like, Oh, I'm gonna join the free agency. No, okay, so you're him, you're right. So. You're right there, but I'll say that he's not a magnet for superstars because yes, he's not he, a magnet he, for superstars. He is going to be the leader of the team, and everyone wants to be the leader of the team, you know. And when you mm-hmm. when you share it right with a group of guys, uh, something has to be like really perfect, like the big three in Miami, right? Like they knew what it was. Like Chris yeah. Bosh willingly went from being the number one player on the Toronto Raptors to being the number three player, right? Yeah. So it has sure. to be I mean, some sort of give and take. And superstars aren't always willing to give that up. Like Kyrie Irving is only at this point willing to give that up, I think, you know? Exactly, so yeah. It, it takes some sort of learning. And, 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 and I get, you know, why you're going to make that point. But what I'll say is that if I'm David Griffin, I have to understand that while he's not – while LeBron is not a superstar magnet, he is a magnet for slightly above average guys – that can really be turned into something great. You know what I mean? I'm thinking guys yeah. like a Michael Carter Williams, right? Like you, mm-hmm. someone who knows how to play basketball who just needs someone else to elevate their game. And LeBron can no, elevate I, I, anyone yeah. else's game. So long I as understand. they're not someone who's already a superstar. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's the only circumstance. Yeah. So and I think, he's, a, he's a great yeah. guy and he's proven it time after time after time that he can take a team with no one else on it all the way to the finals, right? Mm-hmm. And it's a and it's about making those what what this sounds like to me is that David Griffin is saying it was too hard to dig and search and find those good role players that would help you know LeBron and accent LeBron in the way that you should. It just sounds really really like sad and pathetic to me. But. Yeah, it does. It does. It sounds very defensive. It just sounds like he you know ran a team and he's like oh well. I won a championship and I'm still upset. It's like, me. you know, he sounds, he sounds, he's complaining about something that he really shouldn't be. And I think it's, it's one of those things where I guess it's, you know, I, whatever, he can complain about whatever he wants. But I just think it's, he, he has some sort of argument because if you think about it, it, you know, his caliber wasn't enough to pull Kawhi into LA. He ended up doing his own thing and, and joining the, the Clippers and bringing Paul George in. I think that's what Kawhi Leonard has now established himself as a superstar. Enough to the point where he can be like, "Hey, I want this trade." He has the same power as LeBron now because LeBron was like, "Hey, I want Anthony Davis." Boom, Lakers trade for him. He goes, you know, Kawhi Leonard's on the Clippers now, and he's like, "Hey, I want Paul George." Boom, they trade for Paul George. So it's they're on the same level. They're on that same kind of caliber. I wouldn't necessarily say that you know Kawhi Leonard is LeBron James, but they're he is he is Kawhi Leonard has entered superstar status. If that makes sense. I think Kawhi Leonard's better than LeBron James, but people are gonna bite my head off for that. <laughs> I at, this say, yeah, point, look, yeah, at this point, at this point, point in time, yeah. okay, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I know what you mean. Um, it's like, look, Tom Brady's still mm-hmm. the goat, but he's not the best in the quarterback league right in, now. in the league currently. Yeah, no, I understand your argument. I mean, that's there's just that, other that's, guys with better teams with better opportunity who are gonna who are you know some are younger, some are gonna do more things. Like, I mean, frick, like Pat, Pat Mahomes. Like, I would just take mm-hmm. him in an instant, you know. And Kawhi yeah. is that same, you know. Circumstance matters a lot, and you obviously saw what he did. He proved he can take a team that has, uh, you know, they had a lot, but you know, he took them all the way to the finals. So, no, he definitely yeah, has entered I, superstar status. You're right. Yeah, so it's just one of those things where I think David Griffin, while he does have a couple of points there, and it's saying, oh yeah, LeBron isn't necessarily a magnet. It's hard to build a team, a true established superstar team around him. Mm-hmm. Think about it. Listen, other GMs did it better than you. Think about it. Uh, good GMs will find a way to have a superstar on the team and still build around them properly. Look at the Golden State Warriors. Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, Draymond Green, all in uh, – in, uh, who else am I thinking? Andrea Iguodala, all inside well, players. Gone. All, well, yeah, I know. I, obviously, I'm not talking about still on the team, but I'm just saying they created a super team from the inside. They drafted these guys. They built this guy up. They didn't have to, you know, acquire LeBron in free agency or whatever. The only player they, they really got was from... They did acquire Kevin Durant in free yeah, agency. Yeah, they did acquire from Kevin Durant. I'm not saying... But they the did it. They, 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 they won a championship before that. Yeah, they won a championship before KD, and obviously they, they won, you know, they won with him as well because KD is, you know, that big caliber player. 
But I mean, if you think about it, they made a dynasty out of it. When you think about it, I question if they were better with KD than when they weren't. Well, you know, th- that's the thing. It's one of those things where, you know, it's such a tough conversation because this, KD is very good. But I mean, you know, you have probably the best shooter in NBA history in Steph Curry on your team, and you have a lot of really good talent. And I feel like, you know, Kevin Durant was the best player on mm-hmm. that team, but I just think. Steph Curry was the most skilled player on that team, if that makes sense. He was the most, you know, I don't really yeah, know. Yeah, I just, know I, I, I think the value it. of Clay Thompson and Draymond Green yeah. can't be overstated. They are so, yes, they're I, seen I as like the agree. third and fourth guy on that team, but they are like, they're, a, you know, one or two on any other team. So, exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, that that's, yeah, these David Griffin comments to me, I mean, he just comes off looking like a fool, sounding like a fool. Yeah, yeah. So, mm-hmm. I, you know. I agree. I agree. I'm glad you brought it up. Before we sign off today, uh, Chase, we we didn't have an entertainment segment, but I'm still going to ask you: Did you watch anything good this week? Uh, yeah, I actually did have a couple of interesting things to watch this week. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, there is this one show I'm I'm really into, kind of like mystery. I shouldn't say mystery, but kind of like um, like forensic shows, so like murder mysteries and kind of stuff like that. And, sort of looking in like the the actual like dna and like evidence kind of building like yeah okay you're weird we get it <laughs> so um a show that i really liked uh, that i started watching is called exhibit a and it's only a short series it's not mm-hmm. very long um but it's really good so it kind of just goes into cases where faulty forensics were you know were used in a case and it was like, like forensic oh. files yeah exactly it's like forensic files so you go in but and it's like Netflix's con- version. Yeah, exactly. So Tight. these people were convicted on wrong. They were on wrongful convictions of, um, of based on forensics. They were charged based on like bad testing. Yeah, um, I mean DNA. And, DNA testing has come a long way in the yeah, last exactly. ten years, let alone the last twenty years, let alone the last thirty years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's a great show because it opens your eyes to kind of it shows you at first. It's like the way the show opens, it kind of paints it as like, oh, wow, this guy did all this bad. And, you know, it kind of showing why he deserved to be in prison. That shows that the, the people, the forensic people, makes them sound like an expert in the beginning. But then there's a bunch of, like, facts and science and stuff like that. And then actual other experts who come in and refute what the one expert already said. And it makes them so sound is it, bad. So is it and... just about one guy or are there, is it each episode about someone no, different? No, each episode is about someone new. And I think it's only a, it's only a four-part series. So how long are and the episodes? They're like, I, they're not super long. I don't think. Like an hour. Uh, it, no, they're like, uh, each one's different. So the first one's forty-one minutes. The second one's thirty. The th- third one's thirty-seven, and the fourth one's also thirty-seven. Okay, that's so not bad at they're all. They're shorter. They're not. They're not bad. So and they're well produced. Um, I'm sure. Yeah, they're they're very well produced. The only issue I have with them is the fact that they all end really badly. Like. I, I I'm not I I'm debating whether I I don't not, I don't really think I'm gonna spoil anything. All right, but <laughs> maybe you should. I probably shouldn't. I probably shouldn't. But I'm just gonna. Say I'll watch I it. Can't I'll think. watch it over yeah. the next week, and then we can talk about it. So if anyone listens okay. to this and doesn't want it spoiled, uh, this is your warning. We're gonna spoil it next week. Yeah, <laughs> next week. Okay, my my last question, and you can talk about whatever else you want to talk about. But my last question about this show, what it's Exhibit A. Yes, Exhibit okay. A is what. So called. my my question about Exhibit A is my deal with forensic files and why I don't like it is that they have this like dramatized recreation of the murders, right? Like they tell you the story and they show you the walkthrough, but they don't show anyone's face and they're just like, you know, actors going through what it would be like and then they'll show some crime scene photos. Uh, you know, Mm-hmm. So is it is it like that, or do they have a better way? Because I, I kind of expect Netflix, I hold them to a higher standard, and I kind of expect them to uh, put on a better recreation. Yeah, so they don't actually, like, recreate any of the scenes, I don't that's think. That's good. I think they just kind of show – they really focus on more of the science and the aspect See, of that's, how the fact that – that's more important, and, yeah, because yeah. I just don't like – Forensic Files is always just, like – more about like retelling and faking the story and i'm like i don't yeah, care what it looked like like they're dead i don't want to see yeah. someone die like <laughs> i want to know why the person who killed them is in jail when they didn't actually kill them you know what i mean exactly yeah and that's what it focuses on 
it focuses on the actual forensics and sort of proving the stuff wrong um and kind of it's sort of like the 4k it's like it presents the you know the the person as kind of in a bad light at first and then the the rest of the show like completely or the rest of the episode that like completely supports I hope one of them why actually the person did it wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. What else are you watching? Um, another movie that I really want that I watched that I really like was um, this movie with Paul Rudd in it. It's also on Netflix. It's a little bit older. It's called The Fundamentals of Caring. I've never seen it. It's really really good. Hmm. Um, what is, what kind uh, of movie? I really is it? enjoyed it. Is it a rom com? No, it's not a rom com. I mean, it, I not necessarily. It's one of those things where um, it's kind of hard to explain. So I'll kind of give you a, a basis of the story. So Paul Rudd plays a caregiver in, in the movie, and he's mm-hmm. taking care. He signs up for a job to take care of a kid named Trevor, okay. who has, um, I think he has like cerebral palsy or something. something. I can't remember. Yeah, I he's can't disabled. Remember. Oh, so he, has, he has cystic fibrosis, is, okay. I think was what it is. So he's disabled. He's in a wheelchair or like one of the drivable wheelchairs, and he has to be his caregiver and they grow through a relationship and, um, and they kind of tell his story and on that end. And it's, it's very interesting. It's a cool story about how they grow. So it's their a relationship serious role. And, yeah. It's, I, I think it's a serious role. I mean, it, 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 it very, it's comedy. It's very Paul Rudd. Um, there's a lot of comedy in it, but I think it also has a very good message. Um, you know, it, it, it there are parts where there is definitely comedy, but there are also some serious parts and some right. emotional parts as well. So, I'll be honest. I don't know if I'm going to check that one out, but I will watch Exhibit A. Yeah, I mean, either way, I think they're both <laughs> really good. But uh, you don't have to check that one out. I think it's really good. I don't necessarily know if you enjoy Paul Rudd, but I really enjoy that I movie. do, but I don't know if I want to see him. <laughs> <laughs> um, any Anything else? No, I think that's all I watched. What about you? I want to talk about Season 3 of MasterChef. I encourage you to watch both Season 1 and 2, but Season 3 has been, I think, the best so far. It, they completely rewrote the rules and changed everything, and it, it's just all really cool. Uh, the way they've kept me like at the edge of my seat for three straight seasons, and the best part probably about this season is that there's a blind woman named Christine, and without spoiling how far she's gone or what point I'm at, uh, she's in the top X amount of the competition, but she's blind. And she's just like an outstanding cook and amazing. And it's like, you know, it's one of those feel good stories that like you hope she wins the whole thing because she certainly has the capabilities. It's just like being blind. You're more susceptible to making that one mistake that'll get you kicked out. But it's really inspirational story. So I'll, you know, let you guys know probably next week if she won. But man, MasterChef is the best show I have ever watched. (laughs) Hmm. And as far as other entertainment goes, um, I bought a new game. I bought Let's Go Pikachu for my Nintendo (laughs) Switch. And I'm really happy with it. I think it's fun to play the Pokemon games over again, uh, but with like a 3D setting, you know? And I know people don't like that you can't really battle Pokemon in the wild, but I don't mind, you know? I'm cool with battling trainers and stuff like that, so... Uh, that's what I'm doing right now. It's been pretty fun. Um, yeah, sounds like a blast. <laughs> yeah, man. That's, so maybe I'll have more than just MasterChef next week to talk about, but that's our entertainment for the week. And before we head out, Chase, you want to let the n- people know where to find you? Yeah, so you guys can find me um, on Twitter at Chase Sussex, S-U-S-S-E-X on Twitter. Uh, feel free to send me your comments over there, and if you agree with me or disagree with me on anything that we talked about in this episode, Feel free to shoot me a tweet over there, and uh, we can talk about that. Um, you guys can also find my other podcast, which is uh, at Hockey Town Rundown on Twitter, Hockey T W N Run D W N. Uh, we upload uh, every other week, uh, and we're going to be providing some fun content for you guys over the summer uh, about the Red Wings. So stay tuned for that. Absolutely, and as always, you can find me on Twitter at David Rosenberg. That's R O S E N B E R G G two G's. Um, I'm pretty fun to talk to, so that's my personal. Uh, you can also find us at MSC Countdown. Uh, that's this podcast main Twitter. We tweet about pretty much all the things that we talk about on this show and more, so make sure you're joining the conversation. And if you enjoyed this podcast, uh, share it with a friend. You know, Send it to uh, two or three people and let them know, hey, man, these guys talk about Michigan sports, and they're pretty good. And as always, make sure that you're following our main site's Twitter at Mish Sports Ent, that's at M I C H Sports E N T. And we post all of the articles from MichiganSportsAndEntertainment.com up there. 
uh, that should be your go-to source for all the Tigers and Pistons and Lions and Red Wings and everyone else, all that news. And we do a lot of pro wrestling stuff too. So thanks so much for listening, guys, and we'll talk to you again after a while. Peace.